today on CityCast Madison. What's more than two stories tall, weighs 30 tons, and is regarded as one of the finest of its kind in the world. I'm talking about the pipe organ at Madison's Overture Center for the Arts, of course. It features more than 4,000 pipes, and is believed to be the heaviest movable object in any theater on earth. CityCast Madison host, Bianca Martin, spoke with a man who knows this pipe organ better than anyone, Greg Zalek, the principal organist for the Madison Symphony Orchestra. It's Tuesday, August 1st. I'm Dylan Brogan, and here's what Madison's talking about. Hi, Bianca. You are the principal organist at the Madison Symphony Orchestra and the curator of the Overture Concert Organ. I'm new to hearing like just how special our organ is, so I'm excited to get into that. But, you know, when I think about the organ, I was introduced to it, you know, in in church settings um, and maybe think of it as a little bit of like an older thing. What draws you to the instrument? Yeah, I think that's often people's primary exposure to the organ. That was my primary exposure when I was when I was a kid. But I think that the organ in general is something that while a lot of people might not understand or have a lot of exposure to the instrument itself, if you do get a chance to hear it, it's a very thrilling experience. You walk into Overture Hall, it's the backdrop of the stage, and it's just visually so remarkable. I have you know, growing up in Miami, I think there were a lot of people that didn't understand why I had moved to the middle of this country because <laughs> I certainly didn't know anyone in Madison before moving here. Right. And those folks that have now come and either seen me perform or gone into the hall now understand why it is that I'm in Madison because it is like a jaw dropping just from a visual perspective. It's so enormous and spectacular. And then there's the virtuosic element of just how difficult it looks to physically play the organ. Yeah, because you're like all sorts of involved <laughs> to play the yeah, organ, yeah. right? Yeah, both my hands, both my feet, I'm pushing buttons, I'm opening boxes. There's a, t- a ton is going on. And I always tell people like my goal is to make everything I'm doing look fairly easy in spite of the fact that I'm extraordinarily focused as I'm performing uh, a concert just because of how much is going on, not just physically, but also like in my mind to make sure I remember where I need to be at every single given moment. I also think that whenever I play solo music, I play from memory, which I think again- Wait, what? From memory? Yeah, which on the organ is particularly complicated because outside of just the music itself, you also have to remember all of your presets because- the way in which you change sounds on the organ is through setting presets ahead of the concert. So I have to not only remember the music itself, which is has its own demands, but also just the sounds from the beginning to the end of the concert that I'm going to be changing. Sometimes I change over 2,000 sounds, and I have to remember where those buttons are located. Am I pushing the button with my hand? Am I pushing it with my feet because my hands aren't available? Am I opening a box in order for the sound to come out? Am I closing a box in order to quiet the sound? So a lot of that goes into sort of like the art of playing the organ. Also just the performer speaking, you know, kind of explaining certain things that I'm doing at the instrument before I play a piece, I think is always a great thing. My my fiance was the one that told me, I did it one time years ago where I kind of explained what I was doing at a particular moment in a piece of music. And she was like, I had no idea that that's what you were doing. Like, I, She's like, I think 99% of people have no clue what it is you're doing and just hearing what it is that you're going to be doing so that then when the moment comes, people are like, oh, I now understand what he's physically doing to create this moment in that music, um, I think is also helpful. Yeah. So it's such a... I think it's an easy sell once people come to know that we have this instrument and get to hear it and experience it for the first time. The issue a lot of the time is that because the organ's so unfamiliar to people, how do you get them into the hall for the first time? And that's what we've been... Right, how do you get them in the doors? How do you get them in the doors? And that's been like, I've, I've been very proud that over the, the six years I've been here, we've seen the audience grow. And I think a lot of that is because there's so much pride in Madison that 
folks come and they sort of do the job for us of word of mouth of telling other people. Yeah, I mean, word of mouth. One of um, you listening reached out to us and told us about you, Greg. So um, it was word of mouth, literally what you're what you're saying right now. The gospel. <laughs> people are talking. Well, I feel like we have to talk about the organ itself because it's insane and you were describing it. And I've seen an image and I <laughs> I basically see you sat there and it showed the scale is insane. Like you, in contrast to this organ, it's like the whole wall of this hall and there are different types of organs. This one's been described as one of the world's finest. Why is that? What makes it so fine? Yeah, I think there are a variety of aspects to this particular organ that make it so exceptional and make it so unique. A lot of it was the fact that they decided to put an organ into the hall when the hall was built. I know a lot of places that when the hall was initially being built, someone had the idea of perhaps putting in a, a pipe organ. And they said, well, well, we'll maybe do that after the hall is built. And the organ never was never put in. And I think we're very lucky here in Madison that they had the foresight of someone had the idea and then not only that they had the idea, but they followed through with it and they got the funding through Pleasant Roland. We're coming up now on 20 years, so we'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the organ, not this upcoming season, but the following, which is remarkable. So obviously for, for folks that have been to Overture, not necessarily for a symphony or an organ concert, They've probably never seen the organ because the organ is on a railroad track that literally the entire chamber where all the pipes are, where all the sound comes out of, sits on a railroad track. And it gets... Wait, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> on... The organ itself is on a railroad track? That's it? Yep, That's the left side amazing. Of the or, yep, the left side of the organ is on <laughs> wheels. The right side of the organ has its own set of wheels and it's on this sort of railroad looking track and... It takes about 45 minutes to very slowly move it to the very back of the hall where then the doors are closed and you don't you don't see it at all. And then when we use it for the backdrop of the symphony and obviously for the organ, it gets brought forward. The doors get, so, get opened up. You then see the pipes and then the console, which is where I play from, which is like where I'm I, you know, you play on the keyboards and then it makes the connection to the chamber gets brought out from a room. The console sits in a separate room, gets brought out, plugged in, and then we're off and running. So what um, a process. Yeah. And what a unique design, because I've never seen an instrument like this before, where they were able to not only give us a spectacular instrument that the organ series and that the symphony can use, but they also didn't force other organizations that come to Overture to perform to have to have this as the backdrop, right? Like you think of the Lion King, it would be strange to have a pipe organ in the back when they lift Simba up, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, yeah. it's nice that they can, that in of itself is also very unique. And then I think just the the versatility of the organ itself in terms of the repertoire that I can play on it, you can play everything on this thing. I played with a counter tenor. We did gospel music for the second half of the program very successfully. The organ was completely adaptable to that. Then, of course, we play our classical programs and it plays all variety of repertoire from the 1600s to today. And like in October, we're doing this Latin American concert and I've already started to set some things up. And I just think it's a very functional instrument. In terms of it being amenable to a certain you know, style of music, like, can you break that down a little bit more? Yeah, that's a great question because it's nothing that you're doing physically to the instrument itself. So all of the sounds and all of the and all of the stops, which are the given sounds that the organist then chooses, and you can put them together, you can use them in solo capacities. That's where you come up with the decisions of how to change how the organ sounds. So it's not the the physical pipes themselves. The sounds themselves don't don't change. It's how I use them in combination with each other that lends itself better to a certain style of music or doesn't. So every time you sit down in an organ, like some composers will say the sounds that they'd like you to choose from. But of course, they were writing, let's say, in the 1800s. And so obviously the sound of the organ today at Overture Hall is very different than the sound of perhaps the church that they were composing in. So I then like look at that. I take it as advice, perhaps, but then 
I will choose sounds depending on what I think serves the music best for that particular piece of music in, in that in that particular program for this given space. It's probably the biggest challenge is that every time you sit down, it's a completely new experience of how the organist is making this music come to life. And it's a very daunting one. It takes hours in order for me to set up these programs. Sometimes it's 15, 20 hours of like figuring out for, you know, for let's say an hour of music, what do I want this program to sound like? What do I want each given piece to sound like? Um, and then it's setting up all my presets so that I can just go to them directly and and then play those given sounds. On this particular organ, I think it's very adaptable at being able to put different sounds together that make the music sound appropriate, you know, sound the yeah. way we're kind of expecting in our head. I, I played in April a piece that just the music itself sounded so circus-like. And so I picked sounds specifically that sounded to me like you would hear in Baraboo, Wisconsin, for instance. Oh, yeah, which I love. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I'm from Baraboo, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I told the audience, you know, I've chosen what you're going to hear. I've chosen specifically to sound like that. And then, of course, you play it and you hear the audience laughing because it sounds so ridiculously circus-like. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, but, then you go, but then you go from that and you play a work with like a cellist and suddenly you're transported to such a different sense of, of music making. And you're Cuban American, pretty fun because you are doing a whole thing here in the fall. Like the next upcoming season is going to be Latin American based, so you get to bring more of yourself. Well, I guess I don't want to say more of yourself, but a part of yourself forward. Yeah, yeah. I'm born and raised in Miami, Florida, um, in a Cuban household, and it it's it's funny because I've now been in Madison six years, and while people know I'm Cuban, I don't think they know that I speak Spanish. I mean, the, the reason that I play music now is because my grandfather on my mother's side, her father, um, was the one that sort of had the musical gene. And it, it skipped over my mom and her brother. Um, but <laughs> but it, my grandfather could just sit at the piano and play by ear. He never took lessons. And as a kid, I, I could do the same thing. And he was the one that told my mom, he's like, hey, Greg has some musical talent. And... Of course, I grew up listening to all of this Cuban music by Lecuona, and he used to sing all of these Cuban ballads, and we'd sit at the piano, and we'd sing in harmony. And I was like, this is something that I think would be, especially now that I've been here and so many people know know me in a, in a personal way, I thought, well, what a great thing to also be able to share this aspect that while a lot of people do know me, they don't know this aspect of, of who I am. And so I was like, you know, I'd love to just play a lot of this Cuban music for this audience. And... I played guitar as a kid. I contacted my guitar teacher and we put together this this sort of four-piece band. So we'll have a, a flutist, which is a very popular instrument with Cuban salsa music. If you've ever heard Cuban salsa music, the flute's always a major instrument that you probably don't even know is playing, but it's very present in the background. Um, oh. So we'll have a guitarist, I didn't a know that. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And if you heard... If you heard that type of sound, you'd you'd recognize it right away. Um, if you heard like if you heard salsa music, you'd recognize that there's a flute. So we'll have a flutist, a bassist, a guitarist, and a percussionist, and then we'll have the organ. We're gonna see how we kind of put all of these instruments together. Uh, it's funny because some of these musicians have sent me videos of it's not a pipe organ; it's more of like one of those street organs. And apparently in Cuba. It was a very popular instrument to have this street organ playing a lot of these ballads with other instrumentalists, like with percussionists, which I did not even know about prior to putting this program together. So it's been great because I've wow. been listening to a lot of these albums of a lot of these pieces of music that I've, you know, like Son de la Loma and El Maricero and all these songs that people that I grew up listening to but didn't associate at all with the organ that we're now going to be able to bring here in Madison you know, to overture. So I'm just very excited about it. I'm going to sing and play. My, my grandfather wrote some lyrics to some of these songs. So 
I talked to the guitarist because he and I used to like sing and play guitar together. And I was like, oh, why don't we sing some of these lyrics for the first time? Because no one's ever played these before. They were, you know, they were left after my grandfather passed away. They were found in like a in like a box that he had had of his of his stuff. And Will they're you just, sing us a little bit? I mean, I can sing a little bit. A couple it's, bars. It, yeah, I'm trying to think of what the lyrics are. It's like, no importa de donde son, de la vara o de Santiago. Si ellos cantan en la loma, o si cantan en el llano, los encuentro muy galantes, y los quiero conocer. Con sus trovas fascinantes de que a mí todo el mundo las quiere aprender. Oh my god! Yeah, I'm glad it there's no so visual beautiful. aspect. <laughs> but so I'm very excited. I'm very excited because it, um, it, it's just very funny because a lot of these words are so specific to the time that my grandfather was living in Cuba before his family being exiled to the United States. So it just it gives you such like, a, you know, when I read these lyrics, it's just such an emotional thing because you're you're kind of you're seeing their world as it was then. And of course, so much changed when they when they left. But you know, he mentions like cities and stuff that he grew up in. And so it's, I think it's going to be a very special and emotional concert to, to open the season. And then then we'll have two guest artists that are going to play sort of your classical organ programs who are very engaging performers. Again, they play from memory. They'll they'll engage with the audience. And then we close the season with a concert and the UW wind ensemble, the entire wind ensemble and their conductor, Scott Teeple which I think is such a wonderful collaboration between the university and the symphony and the organ series, just because one, it's like the, it's wow. probably the closest that I'll get to being out competed in sound um, by, <laughs> by this ensemble. <laughs> by normally the, the I'm, force. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll probably still win out, but like, I'll definitely have to like play. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to pull out a ton of sounds to make this thing work. So I know I'm just oh very gosh. excited about it. I'm very, very, I'm very excited about the season. It's huge. It's huge. And then the Madison Symphony Orchestra also has free concerts with the farmer's market, right? Yeah, yeah. We have one coming up. I believe it's August, Saturday, August 19th. These farmer's market concerts are wonderful because they're free events. They're for the family. Anyone can just walk in off of the farmer's market on Saturday morning to some air conditioning and to some organ music, you know, which... <laughs> People Can't may not think that. of. Yeah, it doesn't get better than that. So, <laughs> exact. Thank you. Uh, Look, I'm already a convert. <laughs> I know, I know. You're you're selling. I don't you even need me. to talk. Yeah, no, that's great. You should do the pitch for me. Well, Greg, I'm almost speechless. You almost had me in tears there for a second. Tears of joy. Tears of joy. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, tears of joy. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate your spreading the word about this. That was Greg Zellick, principal organist of the Mass and Symphony Orchestra, with CityCast Madison host, Bianca Martin. And here's what else Madison's talking about. The Wisconsin Supreme Court. Judge Janet Protasewicz officially becomes a justice of the state Supreme Court today. In April, Protasewicz won the most expensive judicial election in the nation's history and was backed by Democrats. This marks an ideological shift on Wisconsin's high court, which had been controlled by Republican-backed justices for more than a decade. We'll have an entire episode on what Judge Janet joining the court means for Wisconsin politics coming soon. In other news, the CrossFitters are here. The annual high intensity fitness competition has been held in Madison since 2017. The CrossFit games kick off at the Alliant Energy Center today and run through Sunday, August 6th. The games bring about 50,000 spectators and athletes from around the world to town, and the winner will be declared the fittest on earth. This is also the last year the CrossFit Games will be held in Madison. Last week, organizers announced they'll be moving the competition to another city, which is yet to be announced. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Dylan Brogan. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a pipe fitter about us? We should have mentioned this earlier, but we plumb forgot. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you then.